Warriors have been around for a hundred years, and legends of their destructive potential have been around for 99. But could a ruptured tank really burrow through a brick wall? Into the next count. Here we go. You're your regulator of the tank. Attempt number two. In five, four, cross your fingers. Three, two, one. So that's so that's part of what we're we will talk about. Maybe I'll get this done. So we um, looked at this last time, uh, and so the the sleeping giant, quote unquote, gas cylinder uh, behavior is something maybe beyond where we are now because obviously the mechanism by which that is moving is not just there's some conservation of mass going on there, but what's driving it is the fact that there's air coming out of it very quickly, and it's transferring the momentum of that air to its surroundings, and it's being driven by conservation of momentum. And so we'll get to that in due course, but also uh, it's making the point that as gas comes out of that cylinder, that is what is driving that um, gas cylinder forward. And so if you're able to look at that as a static observer, or if you're attached to the cylinder, rather, then you'd see the gas coming out at some velocity, relatively high velocity. It turns out that if you're in a static location and you're watching that cylinder go past, the molecule of gas that drives it at second one or second two basically comes out of the gas cylinder and sits there in space. It's not moving. It's pushing the, the gas cylinder along. Uh, it's coming out equally as fast as it's driving the gas cylinder, and to a static observer, the air, if you're able to tag a single molecule, would look as if it's not moving. It just comes out and sits there, and the gas cylinder moves off to your left. And so this concept of um, relative velocities uh, is important for things like uh, rocket engines, uh, jet engines in that particular case, or compressed gas engines, but it's also the same principle as this. To the guy sitting on the, the New York Fire Department boat, if it's squirting one meter a second ahead, and the boat is moving at one meter a second, then the sum of those two vectors is two meters a second to a static observer. Likewise, if it's squirting one meter ahead and the boat's going backwards at one meter a second, then the water would appear to a static observer as not moving at all. And so we need to, to take care of that when we kind of round out our view of looking at um, conservation of mass and how we would view that in terms of relative frames of reference. So that's why we spent some time talking about um, frames of reference. So today what I want to do is go through some examples to make that point and so as usual we'll just recap what we've done so far. Um, let's get this set up. Choose my favorite color. Make this big enough. And so you'll remember that we talked about conservation of, um, of mass and we had this expression that defined exactly what that was. It was Reynolds transport theorem. Maybe we'd, we wouldn't worry so much about that, but we'd worry more about what it means if we write it out uh, in a simplified form. 
This part on the right is always zero for us, and we end up with this expression. And almost certainly you would prefer to write it in a form like this. You'll see one important difference here in that this velocity that we had here, I've chosen to write as w. And w is the relative velocity of the gas coming out of that cylinder. So if you're sitting on the, if you're the cylinder and it's coming out of one meter per second and the cylinder is sitting static, that is the, the relative velocity relative to that control surface. And so that's important for us when we start looking at um, control volumes. And so the idea of this is that we can look at these three different kinds of control volumes we talked about. A static non-deforming one, a pipe, water flows in and out of. Um, a moving non-deforming one, which is a jet engine, physically moves in the air, or a gas cylinder for that matter, as it moves in the air but doesn't deform. And one that deforms as it moves, like releasing a, a balloon that's charged with a, an overpressure in it. And so to do that, we need to be able to, to use this relative velocity. And so let's uh, maybe just say something about that before we do anything else. And so the idea is this. Um, yeah. So let's do it for the boat. The boats, I like the boat as an example. I've used that. And so if water is coming out of the boat at some velocity w, and w can be a vector with x, y, and z, We'll think of it really just as in one, one dimension, direction. And if the boat is traveling at the, whoops, at the velocity of the control surface, BCS, then you can basically add these two vectors to each other. And the total vector is going to be the sum of those two. And that is exactly So the velocity to a static observer is equal to uh, the velocity of the control surface plus the velocity of the fluid relative to that control surface. Right? So W is squirting out uh, the hose at one meter a second. Uh, if the boat is going at one meter a second, then by definition, V static is equal to one plus one. Vector sum. If the boat happens to be going backwards at uh, minus one meter a second, then to a static observer, V static is equal to control surface, which is minus 1, plus 1, which is this, W, and it's equal to 0. And so that's it. So that's, we, we need to have that concept. And that's basically what's uh, written here for us, is that we have to, to know exactly how those work. These are vectors. So they could have components of x, y, and z. But you recall that the way we write this, if we go back to this, the way we write this is this term here is the the magnitude of that flow, which is normal to the boundary. V dot n is just the component which is normal to the boundary. And so if it's coming out of a flat uh, side of a box, then it's just the, the component that comes out normal to the, the side of that box. And so we'll always, I don't think we'll need to use anything fancier than that really in this class. And so understanding that is, is key. So if we then write this out, as we did last time, Remember, we differentiated this by parts. So this becomes, in our terminology, uh, the derivative of this is equal to the derivative of this times this plus the derivative of this. Well, you know how you do it. So derivative by parts is rho times the rate of change with time of volume plus volume times the rate of change in time of density 
plus the sum of all the mass flow rates. And the mass flow rates are density times area times the velocity. And those have to equal zero. So these have to be this has to be the velocity normal to the boundary. I'm going to run out of space. Boundary. In other words, it's this v dot n term or w dot n term. Okay. And what else do I need to say? Okay, this is what we've called in the past, this is what we've called the mass flow rate, m dot. Right? Area times velocity is meters squared times length over time, which is meters cubed per time. Density is kilograms per meters cubed, so this is kilograms per time second. So that's the other thing. And we need to remember our sign convention. And that is if, um, well, let's do it in terms of W. If W is out, then it's positive. If W is in, then it's negative. So if you remember that as a sign convention, then you're you're golden. So, so that's that's basically what we need to know. And so what I want to do today is spend some time kind of trying to solve a very simple problem, uh, filling up a beaker basically, by using these kinds of concepts and show that irrespective of the problem we should be able to apply these different concepts of control volumes to be able to solve the same problem and get the same result. That's, that's basically the, the watchword. And so we made the point that we can use these three different reference frames. And we kind of drew it last time. And maybe we'll do that again. Um, yeah, why don't, why don't we just make the point? You've seen the video. I guess I have it on my desktop somewhere. Well, I guess it won't do it unless I close this up. This is it here. So this is the, uh, the famous beer making palace in the bottom of my house. Not used for much beer making these days. There's beer drinking going on, but there's not much beer making going on, that's for sure. <laughs> and so this is the idea that, yeah, so you want to know how long it takes to fill a, 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 a glass. If you know the mass flow rate in, and you know the volume, uh, you divide the volume by the mass flow rate, that gives you the time it takes to fill it up. It's the, the normal calculation you do if you just want to do it in your head. Perfectly fine. And so we can apply some more sophisticated ways to do it um, by drawing some, some control volumes to be able to do that. Uh, you remember last time we mentioned the fact that we know that this has to be accelerating as it goes down here. This we could use our ideas of convective acceleration, right? We talked about going up in an elevator and how we move from the substantial derivative to the local derivative. Since we know that the cross-sectional area of this uh, diminishes as we go down, it has to be getting faster, accelerating. And so if we knew, for instance, how the velocity changed with z, dv dz, and we also knew what the velocity was, we could use exactly that to calculate the substantial derivative which would be the acceleration that you'd see if you were that drop of water going down here. And you know that that magnitude, uh, if I did it, did I want to do it here? You'd know that that magnitude, if you were able to take that drop of water as it goes down, if you were able to calculate, you can't calculate that very easily, but you certainly could calculate this. I guess I'm getting off, off message, so I should stop myself. But if you could measure the velocity of the fluid as it's coming down in this spout, because it's wider at the top, narrow at the bottom, so you could, for instance, use V1 A1 is equal to V2 A2. And this would give you the changes in velocity as you go between two points over distance z. So in other words, it would look something like this, I suppose. I'm getting way off topic, but it's fine. Humor me.
So if you knew, you could directly calculate what the change in velocity was from this. You'd have to actually measure the velocity because you need it here. We know that as we're looking at this, let me, let me run it again, that as we look at this, every minute the velocity at the point where my pointer is, is the same velocity. It doesn't change. It's new water that's coming, but it's the same velocity. And so to a static reference frame, this would be a constant magnitude, and it would be the magnitude of the velocity in this central point, which would be Vz. So if we know this and this, you could absolutely calculate what the velocity you felt if you were falling down. And I think if you did the math, I don't think you do it, it this would end up just being g. This would be the acceleration due to gravity. It's no different if the water's coming down as a free jet than if you're just dropping a ball under no pressure and it just falls at its own rate. And so, so that's one thing that we could do. So, but that's not what we're going to do here because we're not really talking about um, momentum conservation, which is really what this is. But we want to be able to use this to, to look at the potential control volumes we can draw for this. And so the potential control volumes are, are that we'd like to be able to use these three forms of control volumes. Static non-deforming, non-deforming that's not static, that's moving, and uh, one that's deforming. And so we should be able to figure what those are. So let me do this. And this, this is probably a bit bigger than it needs to be. And so this is what we talked a little bit about last time, and that is that we could, for instance, make a control volume that would be something like, make it big enough, it looks like this. And it has a portion where fluid is coming in. And I suppose the rest of it um, would be, uh, if this control volume doesn't move, then as this level of water moves up through here, then this is also moving up across this control boundary. There's nothing going across this boundary. There's nothing going across this boundary. So m dot equals 0, m dot equals 0, and also on the bottom. But there is a finite velocity that's crossed here. And so what we can do is we could use the expressions that we have to be able to, to look at that. So that's one way we could look at it. The other way we could look at it, I'm going to go back and just erase this, is to do something similar. So that's the first. I guess that's a, not a static and non-deforming control volume. So if we want a moving control volume that doesn't deform, the so-called you know, the jet engine in our little cameos that I drew, then I suppose it would look like this. It could look like this. So that's the initial control volume, and that's at uh, time zero. But we know the level of water is going to rise up in this. What we could do is we could make that control volume, and I'll draw it just slightly offset so you can see it. We can draw it so that it actually travels upwards at some velocity which is the velocity of the control surface, I guess, or volume. Surface would just be one surface of a control volume. Uh, if it's not deforming, then the velocity of the control surface is equal to the velocity of the control volume. Right? If it's not expanding like um, an accordion, then every single part of it's moving at the same rate. So all the control surfaces are moving at the same rate as the control volume, because it's not deforming. And what we could do is we could tag it so that fluid is coming in still through here, but now this is moving up at the same velocity as the water level. And if that was the case, then there would be no mass coming across here. So in other words, mass would be zero on this part, um, but there would be fluid mass coming out the bottom because the control surface is moving through this stagnant water that's in the bottom of the glass. And so there is stuff that's coming across this surface. So that's the other way that we could do it. So this would be, if I wrote it out, this is um, 
non-deforming. Can't write on there. But moving, not static. So the first one we did was non-deforming and static. This one's non-deforming and moving. So it just moves as a, a box through the system. And the final one would be to try to do similar things. Get rid of this. And that is to go back in here. And so this would be deforming. So what we could do is we could draw this box where it looks at the first place. Oops. And then we allow it to move and deform. So we could move both surfaces randomly, but it's probably easier if we anchor the bottom one here. And we allow that to, to actually move up here. And so by definition, this is going to be no mass. This is going to be mass flow rate is zero. Can you see the blue on there? I, I see it pretty well, but maybe a maybe better color I could use. Um, and so the other thing that we might want to do is that this is definitely fluid coming in through here at some mass rate, which is not equal to zero. Uh, but if we tag this surface here to be moving at some velocity, which is the velocity of, I'll very deliberately call it the control surface here, because clearly this surface is moving at some velocity, but this surface is not moving at all. So in this particular case, the velocity of the control volume is not equal to the velocity of the control surface. So there's a subtle, subtle distinction. And so the mass flow rate here across this surface would be equal to zero, but there'd be some mass in. And so hopefully we could solve all of these problems just using these three different concepts, and you should get the same results. So the result you might want to ask is, how long does it take to fill it? And that's the, the question we're going to ask ourselves. Okay? So um, let's try it. Let's go through those examples. Uh, I guess I don't need to get rid of that, but I can. So. So the idea is this then. What you'll see in these notes is we basically go through this example um, using this geometry that we've talked about. And I'm not going to do that today. So uh, I guess my suggestion is that what you might want to do is if you want to see how we did it before, you can go and check out 303. Um, it would be... I guess the 2015, when is it? It'll be relabeled to the 2015 class. And you see we do things slightly similar each time, maybe a bit different. But I think at the end of this one, yeah, we, we go through these three different cases for this beaker with a um, water coming down and slowly filling up. It's not an ideal one to do. And the reason is that we have to account for the fact that in, when we do these, uh, let me just stop this. when we do the, the mass balance, it's a bit more complicated than it would be if, if we arranged the, the geometry in a slightly different way. And so the, the slightly different way that I want to arrange this, I'm going to use this now, I'm going to do everything by hand, uh, to make this case, is that the way we're not going to do it is the way of the beaker filling up that we've just looked at in the video. And I don't have a better video to use of the geometry we'll use, but take it on trust that it's not the best way for us to do it. Contro conservation of mass. So basically, here's the, the problem with the beer glass.
And that is that if you take this beer glass that looks like this, going into our control volume, which would have a height given by H, and it has an area A2 and an area A1, which is basically what we used in those other videos, is that you have to account for this stream of water which is coming into it as part of the control volumes. And so to get the right result between all these different ways of solving it, we have to actually account for the fact that we have this column of fluid coming in through here, which has some height to it and has some cross-sectional area to it, and that has to become part of the calculation. And if we don't account for that, then we don't get the result, same result between all three methods. So that's all I'm going to say, because it's going to take too long to, to make the point. So instead of using this geometry, let's use a geometry which is slightly different. And our geometry will be uh, almost like a cistern, I suppose, for a, a toilet. Not quite as nice a mental picture as uh, having a beer glass, I don't think, but just as equally useful. So we're going to fill it from the bottom. And this would be our cross-sectional area A, uh, 2. This is going to be our cross-sectional area A1. We have water going in at velocity V1. And let's start off with a geometry, if I draw this well, that has some initial height that's filled. We'll call that H0. And we're going to want to fill it up at the top. And we'll call that stage. And so we'd like to do something like um, time to fill. F-I-L-L, -L, not P-H-I-L-L. -L. It's going to be equal to the mass of the container divided by the mass rate that you're filling it with. And that's exactly what you do, which is also if the, the density is constant, would also be the volume of the container divided by the volume rate that you'd fill it with, right? This is just Q, uppercase Q. So if it's one meter cubed and you pour it in at uh, half a meter cubed per second, it takes two seconds to fill. It's exactly the calculation you use. And so that's what we're going to attempt to do. And so we'd like to, to be able to, to deal with this in a variety of different ways. So the first one, we said that you have these three ways. We've got the pipe that stuff is flowing through. We've got the jet engine, which is moving but not deforming. And we've got the balloon, which is moving and deforming. So we can use each of those to be able to figure out exactly what that is. So I guess in this case, you could figure out the time to fill would be what? T is going to be equal to, the volume is just equal to A2 times H, assuming that we start off at this point here. And the volumetric flow rate is just going to be V1, A1. And that is exactly how long it would take us to fill this up. So that's the, the calculation that we'd like to emulate in all of these. So let's start off with um, non-deforming and static. Simplest one. And maybe I should, uh, let's, let me draw this out yeah, slightly differently. So let me just scoot this up a bit. So in terms of the colors of this geometry, let's do it this way. So we've got this, got this, got this. I'm going to draw our control volume as being this blue part on the bottom. So you'll recognize uh, this, I think. So this is V1 on A1. This is what we called H0. If 
we want to do it that way. So that's our, our geometry. What's our uh, conservation expression? So conservation. So density of the fluid multiplied by the volume, the rate change of volume, plus the volume multiplied by the rate change of density, plus the sum of uh, density, area, and relative velocity, w, equals zero. So that's our statement. This, uh, definitively, our control volume is going to be this part here. It's not going to change. Uh, where is it? Yeah, okay. So this is our control volume, C volume. And we're going to write it for this. So this refers to the control volume. Water's flowing in, pressure doesn't change, water's incompressible anyway, so the rate of change of density is zero. The control volume, by definition, is not deforming, and so it doesn't get bigger with time. And so by definition, this has to be zero as well. And you can see it's that. And so all we're going to have to do is we're going to have to sum up these uh, components of the fluid mass. And we can just do that by looking at what those would be. And so what do we have coming into here? We have an amount coming in. So we have, if I write this out, this is zero plus zero plus... The first one is going to be density times V1 times A1. Nothing's moving. It's coming in at this velocity. It's coming into the system. And we know that the outward normal is in this direction. So our, by our sign convention, this is negative. So you might want to know that. Or I could write minus V. And what do we have going on here? So we have fluid coming out of the top of the system. That is going to be plus the same density. Whatever the volume is relative, velocity is relative to that component. Call it V2. and area A2. This is coming out of this control volume. The surface isn't moving. It's coming out. So this is positive. And so that's our conservation equation. And so we know that density isn't changing. And so we can get rid of this and this. And actually, it's no different from writing Bernoulli, right? As you do it on a streamline, V2, A2, V1, A1. That's exactly what we have here. And so we can rearrange that to get the fact that the velocity 2 is equal to V1, A1 over A2. So we know what the velocity is here. So we know what this is filling up with. So if you wanted to calculate exactly how long it takes to fill, time to fill equals uh, volume over volume rate. Volume is going to be what? H times A2. Volume rate is going to be um, V2 times A2. And if we wanted to do it in terms of V1, I guess we could substitute in for this. And what would we would we'd get something different, I guess, right? So we could get it in terms of 
this would just allow us to get it in terms of a1, I think. So hopefully if this works out, it should be h times a2 divided by a2 multiplied by v2, which is v1 a1 over a2. And I think a bunch of those things should cancel, right? a2 and a2 should go out. Yeah. The same is just saying time would equal distance over velocity. Your distance is h. Yes. If you, if you just, you, yeah. Same, but you're just multiplying by the cross-sectional area to give it in volume. So, and you could multiply it by a density to give it a mass rate. So, yeah. so you could do either way. So, so you end up with hopefully a two h over v one a one. I'd write it that way here because that's here. This is just a simple way of figuring it out. So we've just done it. A simple calculation that you could have done in your heads in two seconds by doing it in this convoluted way, but hopefully it makes the, the point that uh, what's going on is here. These really are the, these velocities are the correct velocities because nothing's moving. So the fluid rate in, because this control surface isn't moving, is the same as W that we should be using here. And so we don't have to worry about that. All right? So let's go the next step and do the same thing. I wonder if I can, if I, I'm able to, See if I can do this. I don't know. I'm kind of curious if I can. Does Control C work? It does. The wonders of technology. Uh, I guess it's not so good because we. Uh, no, let me let me just draw it because you're going to be drawing it, maybe. So let me just get rid of that. So, same. So now we're going to do it for a system which is, what do we say? So um, moving, non-deforming and moving. So we'll end up with the same geometry again. We have a, a bucket. This is the delta H on the bottom, right? H0. This is. Is that one where the bottom is equal to what the like, inlet stream was? This uh, is of air. This is velocity v one, and this is still area a one. Right question. But I mean, like we have h dot to account to account for taking out that like inside cylinder. Can you demonstrate? No, we don't. That's, that's exactly why I'm following it up from the bottom because you don't have to screw around for that. Okay. Yeah. So if we if we had it coming in from the top then we'd have to have the cylinder that would be changing and it makes life a bit more complicated. This way, because our system is being replenished from the bottom, we don't have to screw with that. So that's the, the very reason for doing this. Can't remember what color I used before, but I'm gonna make this a bit bigger. So our control volume at time zero looks like this. And our control volume at time after that looks like this. And so the idea is that this thing is moving up at some rate velocity of the control surface. Control volume, actually, I guess. And now we have to, to figure out exactly what the uh, components are. And so what we might want to do is we can again write our conservation equation.
which is going to be density rate of change of volume plus volume rate of change of density plus the sum of density area and relative to the control surface velocity equals zero. The control surface, the magenta, the purple is exactly the same size as the green. So the vol volume of the control surface is not changing. So that's the consequence of that. The density of the fluid, uh, the pressure isn't changing, so we're going to assume that that's zero as well, which should operationally be correct. And so what we're only left with is the, the, the product of these two, two components. So this is, um, yeah, this is a two, the cross-section area of this thing. So what we could do is we could write this out as the two components of this, which control behavior. And that would be that rho 1 A1 W1 plus rho 2 A2 W2, two surfaces we're, we're interested in, um, are given here. Yeah, I'm trying to, okay, so. We also, I guess, need to make the point that, or recall, what is it? That W plus VCS equals V static. And so by definition, if we rearrange that in terms of W, then W will just be equal to V static minus velocity of the control surface. And that's important because this is these are the velocities that we're dealing with here. And this has to equal zero. So what do we have going on in this particular case? Well, we have fluid in here which is uh, stagnant, and so this thing is moving up at the velocity of the control surface, and relative to the static fluid that's present in here. So let's, let's say that we tag the top of this control surface to move up with the rising tide to the top of the water. And so it's moving up at VCS. And so if that's the case, then as this control surface sweeps through this stagnant water, then the water is going to be moving up at moving at zero velocity minus the velocity of the control surface as it moves up. So this term here is going to be rho, well, it's just rho. The area will be this area on the bottom, area two, because it's, this is the area across here is area two. And the velocity of this, well, there's, it will, this is stagnant in here, and so this will be moving up at the, the static velocity of the fluid minus VCS. We haven't really said anything about what this velocity should necessarily be. Um, the fluid is going to be coming out of here and we could have it moving relative to the top surface again we haven't made any assumptions as to what the relative velocities would be and so we can also write this as the density the cross-sectional area of this component here again multiplied by the relative velocity Vs minus Vcs equals zero. And so we could use this to do two things. Right? We could do condition one. And that is it's static. If it's static, 
then by definition VCS is equal to zero. And uh, do we need an extra term in here? Then this would be VCS is zero, then this term here is zero, this term here is zero, and it means that um, the velocity of relative to the boundary, there has to be a negative, this has to be positive, these, these have to be negative to, to work out each other. Um, Well, we've done a static case already, but we're, we're moving. We could, we could also make this volume velocity zero, right, if we chose. <laughs> and so in this particular case, if we move this, the velocity of the control volume as the velocity of the of static observer, then by definition, this term here would be zero. So if V C S is equal to V S. In other words, this is rising at some velocity V S. And if we rise raise the control volume at the same velocity, then by definition this will be zero. This will be zero. And it works out that that is the correct magnitude. So we can calculate the magnitude of, of V S as a function of the control surface. Because then, um, yeah. So if these are equal to zero, then W is zero. So W is zero on this surface here for sure, right? If you're moving up at that velocity, because you're catching it as it as it goes up. This velocity here has to be equal to uh, has to be VCS going out, right? because it's static fluid. And so in this particular case, um, VCS would be equal to the velocity coming in through this. And I guess you could write that as V1, A1 would be the same as V2, A2. And V2 would be the same as before as the ratio of the two areas over this. And so, again, you could use this to be able to calculate the magnitude of the rate at which this control surface would move up through the system, and you'd end up with the same magnitude as we had before. So, yeah, but that's, that's not so, so clear as far as I can see. I think we're missing, uh, yeah, so, so you, you could substitute that in there. So I think... Yeah, maybe the yeah. This certainly is true, and this is the case that it's moving at the same rate. But it seems to me that there's also a a term that's missing in here because these should be. If this is attached to here, then there should be no velocity across this surface. But there still is a velocity of fluid coming out of here across this control surface. So maybe I need to go back to the um, the drawing board on that. So the final one, I guess, if we, we only have a few minutes left, maybe we won't get through it. The final one would be to go through the system where you have this geometry again. So deforming and moving. <coughs> And I suppose the geometry that might be used is to this is 
what it looks like originally. And this is what it looks like as it moves up through here. And so this would have some velocity of the control surface, but these other parts wouldn't be moving at all. And so this is something that's expanding as a function of time. Um, this would be tagged to the top of the water as it moves up through the column. And this would be supplied by some influent um, volume into the system. And so this again would be area two, area one, and I guess this would be moving up at some velocity v2. And so it goes from this control volume so it expands. And so if you write out the conservation expression, it's density times the rate of change of volume plus a volume times the rate of change of density plus the sum of density, area, and velocities of surfaces. We need to know that the velocity of the fluid relative to the boundary plus the velocity of the control surface is equal to V static. And so the consequence of that is that W is equal to Vs minus Vcs. So those are the two expressions we need. Density isn't changing still, but volume is, right? So what is rho v? Rho v dot. Is equal. Yeah. Which is equal to rho v to a2, right? Yeah. Which is also, as you say, rho v1 a1. So we have this term here that we now know. If we look at the magnitudes of the velocities that come across here, so in other words, the expression is going to be rho v2 a2 plus, I guess I should have started labeling these surfaces. This would be uh, m1 and this would be m2. Then this would be plus m dot 1 plus m dot 2 equals 0. Um, and of these, I suppose, what's m1? m1 is going to be v1 a1 rho. It's going into this control volume, and so it's going to be negative. M2 is going to be, if this is moving up at the, at the velocity of, um, of the fluid 2, then this is going to be equal to um, plus density A2 W2. And so rho v2 a2, getting out of time. And so this is going to be rho, I'm not sure we get to the end of this, a2 minus v1 a1 rho plus this value here, which is density area 2 multiplied by uh, velocity to a static observer minus the velocity of the control surface equals zero. 
And so we want this velocity, the control surface, to be going up as exactly the same rate as we see this tide rising. And so by definition, I suppose, if we attach it to the top of this thing, this will be zero. And we're just left with this other statement here. Actually, it turns out being that uh, V2 is equal to V1, A1, or A2, which actually does work out much more easily than the other one. And so for this moving control service, if you want to calculate the time taken to fill it up, it's uh, volume divided by volume rate, which is equal to A2H divided by V2H. And you should be able to use this term in here, just as we did before. Here. Well, I, I realize we're a few minutes over. So I think the middle one wasn't so good. The, two, the last one was and the first one was. But it makes the point that you should end up with exactly the same result, regardless of how you end up uh, casting the problem. Static control volume, one that moves, and one that deforms with the system.